I have a habit of looking for uh, good ideas in any place I can find them. Uh, magazines, newspapers, television, bookstores, and I was in a bookstore. And I was in the uh, discount rack where you spin around the rack and there was a book uh, with no cover. And I just looked at it and it just told what the one line, you know, the concept of the book and the flyleaf. And I picked it up and called the publisher and asked for subsidiary rights. And uh, I was able to option the book with my own funds, as slim as they were. Larry Gordon showed me the book. And he had asked me if I'd, at some time in the future, vague future, be interested in it. And I, I certainly said yes. I, I thought that it lent itself to a very pure chase kind of atmosphere. Because I think the immediate attraction was the kind of purity and simplicity. The book itself, Saul Yurick's novel, is an earnest sociological story of gangs, this downtrodden people who were forced into delinquency b because of their uh, deprived status in, in life. It's based on Greek history. Uh, Xenophon was a Greek general, and this takes place right after the war between Athens and Sparta. And he was part of a mercenary army that had gone into the old Persian Empire, which was having a struggle for power between several rival factions for the throne. And uh, they found themselves, after a huge battle, isolated, alone, uh, several thousand miles from the sea. And this mercenary Greek army always felt that if they could get back to the sea, they could then get home. And they were surrounded and they had to fight their way or make alliances by hook or crook and by trick or treat. And the famous uh, moment in Xenophon's Anabasis is where the sea appears before them, where they realize they've made it. Larry had a script developed by David Shaver. I very much liked the idea. And I remember saying to him, but nobody will ever let us do this. This doesn't lend itself to name actors or anything like that. And uh, probably the studios wouldn't go for something like this. I had done Hard Times and The Driver with Walter. So we were trying to put together a, a, a script that we still own and, and still talk about doing called uh, Last Gun. We got the Western set up and we were getting ready to shoot it. I think we were about eight weeks away from shooting and the financial backing pulled out and left us high and dry. So uh, Larry said, I think I might have a window at Paramount if you're still interested in doing the Warriors, but we'd have to go right away. And I said, fine, if, if you can put it together, let's do it. And it came together very, very quickly. I don't think I had made my leap yet into the comic book sensibility of the piece. As a matter of fact, I think the, the film is almost only explicable in comic book terms, the kind of uh, mixture of jeopardy. In many ways, there's a kind of good feeling about the movie to uh, almost silliness, um, but that was the intention. At the very beginning, I said, look, to do this properly and to do the vision of the novel, it really only makes sense if you do it all black and Hispanic. And the studio was not very keen on that idea. And uh, I later came to realize that the studio kind of forced me into the comic book idea, I think, because it was about the only way I could make it all make sense to myself. You had to create a different kind of reality. Riffs! Yeah! Who are the warriors? You had an unusual problem in trying to cast the Warriors because you had to have people, not only did they have to have hopefully an interesting look and the ability to read a line and et cetera, but they had to be physical enough to kind of take what I knew I was gonna put them through. I mean, this, this was a very tough physical movie where they were gonna do a tremendous amount of running it was always the thought to do it, you know, with unknowns. And uh, let me put it this way, there were thousands, it seemed, of unknown actors, kids wanting to be actors and whatever, coming in uh, to see us. You know, we just, we just kept looking until we found the best people.
If you get separated, make it to the platform at Union Square. That's where we change trains. I had done an independent film called Madman that was shot in Israel. Walter Hill was one of the producers of Alien, and Sigourney Weaver was also in this movie that I had done in Israel called Madman. They screened the movie to look at Sigourney to, you know, consider her for the lead that she ended up playing in Alien. And Walter, I guess, liked my performance enough in, in that picture to have me come in and, and, and talk to him about uh, the role in the, in the Warriors. Specifically, I remember meeting with Walter and, and Larry Gordon, the producer. When I met him and all that, I thought, no, I think we can pull this off. Uh, but I did. I saw him in a, a movie that had been made in Israel. I thought he had a, an interesting quality. I only got one question. Who named you leader? Frank Marshall, Larry Gordon, Walter Hill were seated around this huge conference table, and I read the scene from the uh, from the park where I got handcuffed to the bench. Oh, you don't get it. I like it rough. The part was written for a nine foot tall guy, and I'm five ten. I just I had to make this guy big. So I grabbed a hold of the corner of this huge conference table, making like it was the bench, and. Uh, handcuffed myself to it, anchored myself, and I really just played against it and got very enraged with this, this, this whole situation. And in the middle of the, the, the reading, I, I, I really pulled on the thing and lifted the whole corner of this conference table up that weighed hundreds of pounds. I was, I was quite strong at the time. I remember when he auditioned, he just came in and we were in a big room with this huge table. We all sat cross and he got so wound up in his reading that he reached down and he picked up the whole end of the table and lifted it up and I was I'm very impressed with that. Walter went whoa <laughs> and the story I'm told later is that I had to give him the job he, he picked the fucking table up. From the first time he read I knew he was gonna be the guy that I'd want. Cyrus is right about one thing it's all out there. Walt had already seen every actor in New York City and he didn't cast his part. It was the last part that he did not cast. And I walked in there, sat and met with Walter, and after five minutes, Walter kind of, you know, one kind of looks at you and talks like this a little bit, and he does this a lot, and he uh, looks at you, and he said, oh, okay, Harris, uh, I'll see you soon. <laughs> you know? And I walked out, and I remember I just ran down the stairs, got off the elevator, and ran out of the building. Couldn't wait to get the first public phone to call my agent. Jackie, I, I, I think, I think, I think. And she's like, David, calm down, David, calm down. Next day she called me back, she said, David, you're in the worst. How come you're so happy about this? I'm having a good time. That was my first film, The Warriors, my debut. Walter Hill and Larry Gordon saw me in a Broadway play called Working, and I did a monologue in that play about a hippie who espoused peace and love, but was actually extremely passive aggressive. And he sang and played the guitar and he played very positive guys. And I, somehow when I saw it, I thought this guy would make a great villain. That rang some bells for those guys and they just saw that that would be something useful for Luther. I looked right for the part. I had this long, long hair that I wanted to cut, but I had to keep for that part in working, and they decided it was right for this, too. He was obviously a very good actor, and he's got a kind of Richard III kind of quality. Walter described it as Richard III, which hit the bullseye for me, and that's the kind of energy that I tried to bring to it. You know what that is, don't you? Yeah. Trouble. Deborah occupies, obviously, the most screen time of any female presence in the movie. She's a very strong actress, and her character probably has the greatest transition and attitude of, of anybody within the film. She pulled it off, I thought, with enormous style. She's quite theatrical. I was doing theater, and I had done Hair on Broadway, the revival of Hair. That was my first professional job. Got an agent from that, and then you just start pounding the pavement looking for work, and this project came along. I got the impression we kind of had to push them to see me. And my boyfriend at the time, I'm smiling because he was kind of discouraging me because he thought that they were gonna be looking for someone a little more well endowed, among other things. And my agent was sweet. He said, 
you are so well endowed. I went in, I had a few auditions, and it was really scary. I was reading with various people, and sometimes it went well, sometimes it didn't. Ultimately, what I remember Walter saying when I was chosen, he said, you were the unobvious choice. And I really appreciated that. We're gonna go for it? Well, it was a delicate balance that Walter was looking for. We cast it totally out of New York. We didn't bring anybody in from the outside. We really wanted to feel like the movie was New York based. We wanted it to be true to New York and true to the kind of kids that were there at that time. We had a wonderful costume designer, Bobby Mannix. I think actually the first real breakthrough for me on the movie in prep was dealing with Bobby and that every time she would bring something in that was kind of strange, I would not only encourage her, I would encourage her to go further with it. This is a gang picture, and I, 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 I'm not from any neighborhood that had any gangs. I would not know a gang from, from Adam, not at all. I was handed a list of all these wonderful names of gangs that Walter created. And then I just went from there, and then I separate everything by color, or characters by color. And then I just fantasize and come up with these ideas. I just do. I painted the patches different colors. The woman that did all this embroidery, very, very famous woman from England named Rose Clements, who did all this stuff by hand, and she was incredible. I had to separate each individual warrior, and each one of them had a different name, of course, and their names, their own personality, you mix it up, you come out with an individual. It was kind of Bobby and I kicking it back and forth that um, put that stuff together. If you can supply a direction, the collaboration of very talented people on a motion picture, uh, there's no end that they can help you. And the look and the style of the picture is very much attributable to Bobby as well as a number of others. In doing my research, uh, I actually I went to Coney Island and you know I'm walking up and down the boardwalk and there's a tough looking guy working a concession, a ball toss or something, and there's nobody there. And I, I tossed a few balls and I talked with them and I, and I just asked him, I said, what kind of people hang around here? What kind of people come from here? And he puts his arms back and he smiles and he says, the waste kind. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about the Warriors, which set the tone for the Warriors as far as I was concerned. I was standing next to Walter, and I looked way down the boardwalk, and there was one of our PAs talking to a very big man who was in kind of raggedy clothes. And our little PA was standing in front of him. I just saw him brush this PA aside. And the PA got back in front of him again. He was trying to stop him walking into our shot. And he started talking very loudly, and we just stood there. And the guy finally cleared out of the way, and we proceeded. But I said, uh-oh, this is not going to be easy. This is going to be tough. This is New York. Welcome to New York. You see what you get when you mess with the orphans? We were a low-budget film. We shot all at nights, and there were about five other movies that were being made in New York that summer. And so uh, nobody wanted to work on our film. So crew-wise, it was very difficult for us to crew up. One of the first things that happened was that uh, we had to dismiss a first AD, and uh, we had to replace him. And we decided to bring in a first from L.A. Back at that time, it was considered that Los Angeles assistant directors could not do New York street pictures. The crew was too tough, the location shooting was too tough, everything was beyond what we could do. We were too busy eating tofu and beans to be able to handle the streets in New York. So I had to go out there and prove myself. The consequence of it all was that I was looking at it from a perspective of career success or survival. 
And uh, later on, I realized it was like the Odyssey. We would go in 5.30, 6 o'clock in the afternoon to the Gulf and Western building, you know, up by Columbus Circle in New York, get in a van, be driven out to wherever the location was in, you know, whether it was the Bronx or Brooklyn, where we were filming, film all night, be brought back to the Gulf and Western building, you know, we filmed until the sun came up, so you'd get back there, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning or whatever. I'd go home, eat, go to my apartment, usually wake up around 1, 1.30 have something to eat, and I would go to the gym. I was usually at the gym by 2.30 in the afternoon. So throughout that process of filming, I stayed in shape, and you know, and I know others had their regimens as well. We didn't realize how short the nights were in New York in the summer, and the fact that you had to have an hour lunch every night, which meant in reality you were losing an hour and a half in the middle of what was already a short night. One of the things I loved to do was find locations and set them up and get the permission and all those things. So as we were going along, Walter wanted to shoot in real areas. He, he didn't want to shoot on a sound stage. He wanted to shoot in the Bronx and he wanted to shoot in Queens and he wanted to shoot in Coney Island. So I had to have extensive meetings with, um, with the police department and their gang unit and we determined where it was more safe to be and then we would go from there and then we would go look for the locations and try and find the most interesting visuals that we could. Walter did a very clever thing in the script, which is when they look at the subway map of New York and they point out where they are and where they have to get to. And the whole rest of the time in the movie is focused around getting onto the next subway that they need to get onto, which really drove the movie. One of the key links to the movie is the subway. So I also had to establish a relationship with the uh, transit authority uh, because we were either using a station all the time or riding on the subways, and, and that had to be done at night. All movie companies are forced to shoot at the Hoyt Skirmerhorn station, which has a dead track, and you lay the train up at that side. You do the ins and outs of the train. The train pulls in and out. People get on and off. You do that there, and you take the train out on the road. We shot the conclave in Riverside Park, and it was very exciting. We all dressed in one or two trailers. That was it. We knew something special was happening, I think, you know. Well, it was our big money sequence in the movie, and it was unusual because usually you try to have your biggest sequence late in the movie, but we were kind of trapped by the notion of the story. It was very difficult to get everybody into the situation, you know, the, the amount of kids and get them into costume and again the short nights. I think it's the sequence that cements the style of the movie. It not only states the problem of the movie, but as a matter of fact, it rather falsely demonstrates one premise and then the outcome of the sequence then really states the premise of the movie. One gang could run this city, nothing would move without us allowing it to happen. We can tax the crime syndicates, the police, because we got the streets, suckers! Can you dig it? Yeah! My recollection is we had a thousand kids in the Riverside Park riot, and each one was a member of about 200 gangs. There were a lot of gangs, a lot of different colors, and there was a challenge to get these kids to listen and I used what was called, what I call a God mic, where you put up a lot of speakers and amplifier and I have a microphone and it's the voice of God. I fill the room. So I can talk softly, communicate, but also keep it orderly. It, it was a wild, wild four or five nights. We had this wonderful actor who played uh, Cyrus, uh, who had replaced an actor that we cast who we couldn't ever find. He had, he, a real gang member, a real leader of a gang, who we cast, came in, and then when we went to put him in the park, nobody could find him, and who knows, I never, to this day, don't know what had happened to him, never heard from him again. So we cast another guy who was absolutely fabulous. Roger Hill, who played Cyrus, gave his speech, and he very theatrically climbed up on that jungle gym made of wood and started talking about our little piece of turf. I got goosebumps thinking about it. He was just wonderful. Our turf. 
our little piece of turf. That's crap, brothers. Everybody cheering like that. They meant it. It was supremely exciting. He was so good and so charismatic that it actually started to seem almost believable for a minute. It's often imitated. Can you dig it? It was this great kind of faux messianic speech and uh, resonated forever. I was a stunt coordinator on the Warriors and uh, I couldn't find anyone to do that particular stunt. Walter wanted it, so they actually put the afro sheen in my hair and we uh, did the whole thing and I ended up, uh, unfortunately, doing that stunt. But the harder problem was staging a riot with people who never even, they didn't know what a lens was, they'd never been an extra. So I had to get these kids to perform on cue, stop on cue, and make it look like a riot without bumping in anybody. I took the first 50 kids and put them in a circle and ran them counterclockwise. Then I took the next 80 kids and put them in a larger circle and ran them clockwise. And I took the next 110 kids and put them in a larger circle and ran them counterclockwise. But nobody ever bumped into anybody. And they didn't have to learn anything except follow the guy in front of you. It, there's a moment in a movie where you, where you think, boy, if this comes out, this is something. And that, that was the moment because it was so colorful and so exciting and so real and yet surreal. There he is! That's him! That's the warrior! The warriors did it! The warriors did it! The warriors did it! The warriors are blamed. The gangs of New York unite. Opportunity lost, but they can unite on one thing, get the warriors. So that became a statement of what the rest of the movie was going to be. Oh, shit. You all right? Yeah. I was very concerned of one element in our story, and that was that the story was to take place entirely in one night. I thought that it would be um, unreasonable to assume that we won't show up to location one night during the summer in New York and it wouldn't rain. Indeed, we had some pretty heavy rain at times. Now, my suggestion was that very early in the story we would introduce a New York City summer downpour. And the reason I wanted to have that scene is because that gave us the excuse to wet down the street in every take that followed this particular sequence so that we would have the benefit of the wet pavement reflecting all the lights and colors. And uh, I knew that that would not only add to the quality of the image, but also uh, uh, help uh, with the technical shortcomings. Added to these difficulties was the subway. Photographing in the subway, every element had a big asterisk next to it, and on the bottom of the page it said that the asterisk meant impossible. From my point of view, the difficulty once again came from the technical shortcomings at that time. The subway cars, for instance, had a certain type of fluorescent lighting built into it, part of the design of the car, so there was no such thing as turning them off and putting up my lights. What I decided to do was that, first of all, I borrowed some of the tubes from the Transit Authority and uh, my electrical crew made up very makeshift lights for fill and modeling within the car. But we couldn't really correct the areas outside of the car. New York City, for instance, as seen through the windows of the subway cars or the tunnels. And what we did, we just mixed it with so many other colors that the hodgepodge of lighting, in fact, became one of the strengths of the photography. It, it was unusual. It wasn't normal. Shit, this train's had it. Why couldn't it rain now? Come on. I had to go to the transit guy and say, why would a train stop? You know, these guys are on their way, and usually nothing stops the subway. And he said, well, if there's a fire, they would stop. So we created this fire that would, in reality, stop the train, so they had to get off. 
because we were trying to find ways that they would have to engage another gang. When the warriors in their journey back to Coney Island come through the territory that is owned by the orphans, the character of Mercy subsequently really becomes part of our gang and our journey home. Uh, you know, that's her choice and we somehow, especially the character of Swan, tacitly agrees to that happening. I have to say, it's an incomparable position to be in. I, it was amazing. It was just me and a bunch of really cute, great guys. And they made me feel like a million bucks. Everybody did. Walter did, Frank did. And I was trying to dress one night, perhaps in the costume trailer. And all the extras were working that night. And somehow my space disappeared. I had no place to be because they were all dressing. And it was that evening, the guys said, come into our trailer. And from that moment on, that was my trailer too. And they were actually perfect gentlemen always. I don't remember a, an inappropriate moment ever. She had some bad luck, uh, we all did, when making the movie. She had broken her wrist and had to have the cast put on, and we shot around her for several weeks. Then finally we ran out of work, and that's why the, uh, she suddenly appears wearing a coat. There was never really much of a way to explain it. So we just brought her in and I put this coat on her and she announces that she stole it. Where'd you get the coat? I stole it. Cops are looking for somebody in a pink top. In the original screenplay, the character of Mercy and Fox become the love interest. The character of Swan has a different arc that he goes on. He's captured by another gang and held prisoner and eventually escapes from that incarceration and finds his way back in some subway place, meets up with some members of the gang and then they have that final confrontation with the rogues. But I think part of that changed because there was an on-screen chemistry between Deborah and myself that everybody, Walter, Larry Gordon, the editors, whoever was watching that, just saw it happening. On movie things do happen and it became uh, somewhat obvious that the chemistry between Tom Waits, the Fox, and Deborah, that that chemistry wasn't happening, but the chemistry between her and Swan, the Michael Beck character, was happening and it wasn't scripted that way. So. It became then, well, what do we do? I mean, you know, how do we deal with that? And so they came up with the solution of the fox is going to get a fight with the cops and he's going to get thrown in front of the train. He and I weren't communicating very well. I've always felt badly about it. Uh, so finally, I figured out a way to eliminate his character. You think we shot Cyrus? Every gang in the city must be looking for us. Holy shit. You have the warriors and their journey home, which is not just going from one gang to the next, but they split up, they have their separate adventures. The script also adds the tension of scenes with the riffs who are chasing them. David Patrick Kelly as Luther, a great villain in scenes where he's tracking their progress. The, the warriors themselves are almost nerds at the beginning of, uh, of the movie. You know, as opposed to the other gangs who are supposed to look really threatening, the other gangs have a lot more going for them than the warriors. The, the one gang that really has the energy, though, is the Baseball Furies. The moment they come on screen with this makeup and uh, grabbing their baseball bats, you know you're in, in another land. Maybe we better take off. Yeah, right. Holy shit. I did love the Baseball Furies. The full impact for me was when we came out of that subway station and there they all were, you know, they were visually one of my favorite gangs to look at. I think the Baseball Furies were probably my favorite because of the way they looked and I'm also a sports fan. The Baseball Furies, I wanted something that looked furious, like, you know, baseball, of course, baseball uniforms. 
And then I just did do different color combinations. And then along with that, it's what made them scarier. We just kind of painted their faces because Kiss was round, of course, and big. That was probably the influence there. I'm sure you remember the uh, baseball furies chasing the warriors through Central Park. We found this paved road. The problem was that there were no lights. And since we ran a good half a mile every time we made a take, any light I would have put up would have been in the picture. That's exactly what we did. I used these cheap drugstore type clip lights. And we just clip them right up into the tree branches and as the baseball furies are running, the camera is looking at them and there are all these lights in the trees. Now you're wondering why are there lights in the trees? Because I put it there. Well, Walter's approach to the movie was very different. Um, he didn't just want to make an action movie. Each fight sequence was choreographed in a different way to represent a different thing. And they weren't really supposed to be as violent as it would seem. They were choreographed to be almost like a ballet, like a dance, because he felt that in sort of a comic book sense or in the unrealistic sense of the world we were trying to create, that's the way it would look. Walter asked me with each action set piece to write the fights punch by punch so he could really get a sense of what the style was. And when I say I tried to be an extension of Walter Hill, that was an example of it. There's a kind of fun that we were trying to get into the whole thing. Somehow the baseball furies and their bats lent itself. I mean, obviously, the next step is samurai. Well, the baseball furies, that's my character's high point. I mean, he's in his element. He's just, just doing his thing, and it's, it's almost like a samurai flick. And as far as the fights, Walter wanted a very sort of street fight, edgy style. And I think he had a brilliant idea. He asked me to train the cast because he didn't want to have any stunt doubles for the cast. At that time, there weren't that many good picture fight stuntmen in New York. So I basically went out and found gymnasts, um, great athletes, and basically trained them with the same style. So when the fights took place, they had a very fast, phonetic, violent pace. And I think that's what Walter was after. In uh, the case of the baseball furies, which I cut, Walter said to me, make it like Kurosawa, which meant that it was a lot of long lens footage, cut it quickly, but also he shot it a lot of low angles, great, amazing lighting. I had tremendous fun cutting that scene, as much fun as any scene I've ever cut. The Baseball Furies fight, uh, you know, these guys are wearing this makeup, this, this, this cartoon clown makeup, and, you know, Ajax is, is, is kind of a prick. You know, he's got a mouth on him, and he's going to say something, and I'm looking at him. we got baseball bats, we got these guys that look like lollipops, and bang, there, the line was born. I'll shove that bat up your ass and turn you into a popsicle. And, and I have seen that line in a magazine rated as one of the ten best baseball lines of all time. <laughs> The action sequences in The Warriors were very stylized, very cartoonish in nature. If somebody got the crap beat out of them like we did, and all they've got is one little bruise on the side of their face, you know, in reality, nobody would be walking. Well, I, I think that I'd be very remiss if I'd say that my favorite gang wasn't The Warriors, but. Uh, I quite liked the Lizzies. I thought they were a lot of fun, and I thought that we had a lot of fun with that sequence. We said, okay, we should have a, a female gang. We should have an all-girl gang, and they should be as tough and kick the asses of the warriors and lure them into the situation which distracted them, which, you know, obviously all gang members are distracted by a pretty face. I thought the Lizzies were kind of interesting, you know, the fact that it was just an all-girl gang. They didn't have all-girl gangs back in, in 1980. It was sort of saying something about the future at that point in time. This is a chance to really have some good old American fun. I mean, you got all these cute girls, and all we've been doing is running and fighting all night long. A little break in the action. Time to have 20 minutes of some nice stuff here. And these girls seem that they're very much willing to give what we would like to have. So it was interesting to be in that kind of situation, not knowing that they were out to do us harm like every other gang in the city, because we didn't know that. 
when I started to see how it was evolving with the costume design and the production design and everything else, my instinct was to keep them on par with the guys and to have women do picture fights like guys and have them taken out like guys. We took one of them out with a, with a chair. The scene with the Mercedes Rules is a wonderful actress. Uh, I didn't like the scene. I think now looking back at it, I felt very badly about the Ajax character being captured, but I didn't quite see a way out of it. I was a little bit overwhelmed because suddenly I was the only actor on set. All the other warriors had the night off. You go ahead if you want. I'm gonna get a little exercise. One of the great disappointments in the movie to the audience is the fact that the Ajax character is captured and doesn't make it all the way because he, he was quite a popular character. He was obviously a very flawed character in that he was impetuous, jealous, difficult, um, didn't respond terribly well to the crisis in leadership. But at the same time, there was a certain adventurousness and courage about the guy that uh, audiences very much responded to. Show you how I play. So it was a very violent scene. It's a, it was it was physically violent. It was sexually violent. It was emotionally violent. It, it was a very important scene, and it's a sad scene. I mean, I couldn't come back. Uh, I, I wanted very much to come back, but Ajax had to pay. It's not that the character doesn't deserve some kind of dramatic rebuke on his through line. But I think that the end that the character had is not sufficient to the grandeur of what he had been playing up to then. A warrior cannot indulge himself in, in, in sexual license. Not until, not until the time comes. And this is a part of the morality tale of this. That's why Ajax went down. And again, I think that sometimes an actor brings things to a part. James Remar is a very strong actor, and he brought a lot to it that really wasn't, I think, on the page. <laughs> Fucking wimp. Can we stop for a minute? I'm sick of this crap. My legs are getting tired. Come on, just keep walking. We were working in this tunnel. One side was a solid wall in which there were rectangular openings. And through the rectangular openings, you could see into uh, the tracks that was adjoining ours. And when I looked over, I saw this train go by. I remember Deborah and I sitting in chairs, not like, unlike this, you know, your director's chairs, prior to shooting that scene. And really saying to her, in the character of Swan, what I thought about her. I remember Michael asking me, something about like what are you doing or are you okay and, and I said I I'm just trying to feel like I'm alone <laughs> I was just trying to identify with mercy and I just remember him responding with well don't worry you are alone I, I think I did that so that she would have you know that place to come from <laughs> like ooh, rude but it was perfect it was perfect the train was one of the new aluminum trains, and as it went by, it was flashing, reflecting the lights. And I thought that it would be wonderful if I could somehow shine some lights into this tunnel at an angle so it would reflect back into the camera. We put the lights, we rehearsed the scene. To me, it was a tremendously wonderful moment when she pulls him over to this window and they kiss, and here comes this train with an unbelievable thunder and, and, and roar, and these lights are flickering <laughs> behind the, the two heads kissing. One of the directions that we had, which was a technical direction, was that Walter wanted us to stay lip to lip until that last train had passed. You got guys on their little walkie-talkies all the way down the line going, okay, it's coming, it's around the bend. I mean, you know, they, they have it timed perfectly, but it still seemed profound. There's a part of my head that's going, now when is this train going to get by? Because as we're kissing here and doing all this, we have to time this kind of 
break away just as the train goes by. We only had to build one set, uh, the men's room on the BMT subway. And the reason we built it uh, was because there was no men's room on the subway that would have uh, allowed us to do what we had to do in that particular set. The action scenes were really thoroughly covered. It made it a challenge to get through the material as well as it gave you a lot of opportunities to play with it. And it was fun. Fighting people wearing roller skates um, lent itself to all kinds of <laughs> possibilities, I suppose. We just tried to make it different, mix it up. That set was amazing, that bathroom. And you know, we all kind of fed once again on, on Walter's passion. And I think that slow motion can be a, a deadly device. But Walter had a real grasp of what he wanted to see in slow motion, so I really tried to design a sequence that sort of supported his vision. I think it was Walter who always had a theory about slow motion, which was to just use one angle of it in slow motion. And so we would always try and identify the one that would work the best. Actually, Walter's action sequences, I would say in all of his movies, are some of the best action sequences in movies because you always understand what happened. The encounter on the subway between Swan and Mercy and the prom couples that come in, it happens to be one of my favorite. We shot it very quickly. I think it's only got about four setups in it or something like that. We shot it in less than two or three hours. I had some doubts about it, to tell you the truth. I thought maybe it was too corny even for this film at the time. And uh, But I learned a long time ago, if you have doubts, shoot it as best you can and shoot it with whatever you can bring it. So he's accepting her and he's the first guy in her world that's actually taking her in for who she is beyond this facade that we create to protect ourselves. And so it's funny, I feel moved while I'm telling you about it because it is very rich, isn't it? This is what we fought all night to get back to. By the time we end on the subway in Coney Island, you feel everything for these kids and, and you want them something good to happen to them. And it was something that evolved better than I thought it would. Just from reading the script, I didn't think it would be that strong. But the actors and Walter really made it happen. Uh, Coney Island was probably our most difficult location because we had to shoot on the subway platform we had to get them off and that was the one time where the transit police had told us that between the subway platform and the restaurant we were eating at which was down on the street the warriors had to take their colors off because the gang in Coney Island would get offended and might do something to disrupt the shooting so we had to make sure that our guys took off their colors when they went to eat lunch so it was pretty serious and pretty you know, we didn't mess around with it. The Rogue Mobile was a big Cadillac hearse, and there were no seats in it. I think they've given me some apple boxes to sit shotgun in it. So the poor Rogue guys were kind of uh, roughing it in the back seat of the hearse, but uh, it was great. We were kind of stuck. I thought there was a moment that was not working and it just seemed a little flat. And I said to David, I said, come up with something here. It's not enough. Walter decided that he wanted a little bit more of a taunting to happen. I don't care what you do, taunt them, sing to them, and we're only gonna have about five minutes to work something out because we gotta shoot. And I went back to my chair to try to think of something, you know, that's not exactly great direction that I just gave. I live downtown Manhattan in a kind of scary neighborhood, and there was a fellow of a kind of shady background who lived next door to me, and he would always kind of uh, threaten me or make fun of me by saying, Dave, Dave, Dave. It was scary, so I, I said, uh, we can use that for Luther. And out there in Coney Island, they were, at that time, they sold these little midget beer bottles. 
I see David run under the boardwalk, and I thought, hey, you know, I wonder what the hell he's up to. But I knew he was up to something. So we got back in, he got back in the car, and uh, he said, let me try something like this. And he did the... Warriors, come out to play. And there are certain moments where you just say to yourself, this is gold. <laughs> this is very good. And to hear those bottles rattling and, you know, David going, you know, warriors, come out to play. It was like taunting and taunting. Warriors, come out to play. I was a little surprised that he kept it in, but as we were doing it, I had a feeling it would be in there. Most of the crew was barely aware of what he was doing because somehow we were under the dock and we had just found some woman's purse and there was money in it and what are we supposed to do? And It was really weird when you, when you saw it in dailies and I think I extended it longer than he actually did it because I started the sound over them and then you came to him bringing the bottles up. Uh, it, was, it was real creepy. <laughs> I'd love to tell you that I dreamed up the whole thing, but I created an opportunity for something, but he did the rest. That was one of the most powerful moments in the picture, you know, when he did that. And we stayed away from him. We, nobody went around him until we actually had to get close to him on the beach. David Patrick Kelly uh, elected, as part of the way he was going to arrive at his performance, to not speak to any of the warriors, you know, and he stayed true to that throughout the whole time of filming. The only time that there was any conversation that I had with David was when we actually came to playing that final confrontation. When we see the ocean, we figure we're home. We're safe. This time you got it wrong. With Michael on the beach is the most Western moment for me. I mean, that's the big duel, the big shootout, the big mano a mano even though one guy has got all the artillery, supposedly, but no. You're dead! Swan! You warriors are good. We are good. The best. Be looking good, warriors. All the way back to Coney. The great Lynn Thigpen was with me in that musical, Working. And we both got picked from that musical. And uh, she sat by me when we saw the rough cut. And I think she was shocked that it was just her mouth. The uh, notion of it really was in uh, the Shaber script. I just took the idea and made it a bigger idea. She became like a Greek chorus for the movie, always telling us where they were, how much farther they had to go. Lynn came in and read for the part. I just thought she had a great voice and uh, she had a great look. The super close-ups was something that happened just on the set. I kept saying, go closer, go closer. But later she said, to me that she didn't know we were making a classic because her lips are like nobody else's lips and Lynn Thigpen as the DJ is also one of the great memorable moments of that. With all the difficulties that I described to you about night photography in New York, the shooting of those scenes was even more difficult than the night photography. It was the last thing, and it was a nightmare where the waves would change, and there's terrible mismatches on the waves and the stuff behind, and the, we had the cameras broke down, and uh, it was a hard sequence. Uh, the whole very end thing where they all walk away, we were just racing against the setting sun. Walter explained to us that, you know, this, this is what I want you to do. You know, you just keep walking. Finally, you'll hear somebody or we'll let you guys know that the scene is cut. And, you know, we're walking and walking and walking. And, and you're, you're holding on to character, even though you know by now you are just a, a tiny little figure walking off. We had been walking for a very long time, and I remember whispering to Michael, I wanted to turn around because nobody had yelled, cut, I, am I deaf? I don't know what's happening. He's going, 
just keep walking. Finally, we walk right over a dune. We're like out of frame. It's like, okay, this is ridiculous. I mean, we walked halfway back to Manhattan. We decided they must be finished with us, and we had to go find the road, and we had to work our way back. And when we re-arrived, Walter and Frank were there with a dozen red roses. So that was just completely exemplary and amazing. We went on pure instinct and gut feelings on the movie. We just kept going forward, trying to make the story work, trying to make it visually exciting. And I think it was that kind of adrenaline that we had going and the momentum that we had going and the rush to finish that helped add to the energy that the movie had. I thought that in the editing, that we should be absolutely ruthless and make it move, 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 move. That uh, this was meant to be an emotional experience and that we wanted it to be very dynamic. There really wasn't a lot to think about, so keep it moving, keep it moving. One of the reasons we had to have three cutting rooms going nonstop was that we were rushing to finish to beat the other gang movies that were coming out. Uh, the one that was really paralleling us was The Wanderers. They were shooting almost at the same time. It was based on a book like ours. It was a, a, a good story, totally different than our story. But, you know, you get put in the category of it's a gang movie. We wanted to be the first out, and we were. So we laid on the uh, full-scale editorial, and we were working six, seven days a week. We worked days. We worked nights. We, we didn't work around the clock, but we worked a lot of hours, seven days a week. From the time we finished shooting until we were in the dubbing stage, of, I can't remember how many weeks it was, but it wasn't very long. What are you doing? Can you say goodbye? There was a scene at Coney Island that started the film where uh, they basically just discussed the conclave that was about to happen and said goodbye. And I told him that I thought it was a mistake, from my point of view, that this scene at the beginning of the film be a daytime scene. It just didn't seem to mesh. And he agreed. It just fell right out of the movie. It didn't seem to fit in. Once you started the movie at night and got into that, it all just came together. And uh, so I always say that you don't really cut things out so much as they fall out. I know a lot of you aren't too happy about going out on patrol. Just remember this. Out of a street family of 120 plus affiliates, you were chosen for this expedition. The film has its own kind of truth. The film just shows you what's there and what isn't, what's working, what isn't. He went back and shot the material that had the warriors talking to each other over shoulder shots with no context and then intercutting some of the horseplay that had been filmed on their way up north with this limbo footage of them talking to each other and shots of the map which had always been planned the subway map one of the things that we did in transitions editing wise is we used a lot of wipes a very old-fashioned technique that says meanwhile back at the wherever the artificiality of the wipes was part of the notion of this isn't real life. Barry was working under terrific time pressure, and I kept emphasizing to him how much I wanted the music to reinforce the movement and to speed us along even more. And he came in admirably on that. I was signed to do the score, and at that time, synthesizers were just being introduced, believe it or not. And I thought it was a nice overlay. Let's go with rock and roll and let's add the synthesizers to give it just a little bit of eeriness and uh, just a different texture. Fucking A. Walter and I didn't feel we should put music in the baseball bat scene. We didn't want to take away from the reality. Larry Gordon, on the other hand, said there's a little too much reality there for me. And in fact, to put music in that scene, I had to borrow music from another place in the picture. But I think Larry was right. Without music, the scene is much more violent. With music, it in some way reminds the viewer that this is just a game. 
and I believe it's the first entire score that was written with a rock and roll synthesizer approach. It's rock and roll without lyrics, except for the end title, uh, In the City. Joe Walsh is a friend of mine, and we wrote that together. And happily for me, the Eagles recorded it after the fact. It was on the Long Run album and on the Hell Freezes Over album. So it's had a wonderful run for me. It was a little bit different from the score, but it was definitely rock and roll. Originally, there was narration to the movie, sort of setting the movie in its context. And we um, had Orson Welles to come do the narration. I had, uh, Frank and I had worked with Orson on this movie called The Other Side of, of the Wind. Ultimately, it fell apart. But I think that would have been an interesting thing if we would have had Orson's narration at the beginning of the movie and, and setting the movie in, in the context that Walter saw it. I was so frightened if nobody would come, it'd be a flop. I had no confidence in this movie to be a hit. I knew we had a good movie but I just couldn't imagine people pouring out for this movie. I remember I was in New York, and we had a big screening. It was tied to a radio station or something, uh, and we had essentially a screening for teenagers. And I was at that, and we blew the roof off the place. So I thought maybe, you know, maybe something was happening here. Um, I think there were six or seven movies that opened that weekend. I had heard that we were doing great business and the audiences were having a great time in the theaters and that it looked like we were off to be, uh, to be a big hit. The first response, the newspapers, was almost universally bad. And then the next wave, the kind of magazines and longer reviews and all that, were on the whole quite good. And boom, we were number one. And then the word of mouth started to spread and we sort of snowballed into this thing that was happening that, that had never really happened before. Then we had a couple of incidents that totally stopped everything. And suddenly, all I'm hearing is that if you go to this movie, The Warriors, somehow people will become agitated and they will begin rioting in the movie and you risk your life going to the movie. That was the word on the street. I think we were all kind of confused and didn't quite know what to make of it all. I think it's clear now, because so many films have had the same kind of problem, what did happen was that certain gangs were attracted to the movie because of its subject matter, and uh, they saw their traditional rivals across the way, and uh, sometimes they got into it. The studio, I think the only thing you can say is they panicked. They pulled the marketing first, and, they, and it still kept going, and then they pulled the movie. I, obviously, I thought that was an unfortunate uh, turn of events, and the movie kind of got labeled, but I'm a great believer that you make the movies and you sign the movie, and that's it. So I think you, you put it up there. If some people had a bad reaction to it, I'm sorry. It wasn't the intention. But the vast majority, I think, had a good reaction to it, and they, they seemed to continue to do so, so. Because it's not about gratuitous violence. It's, it, it's just about some these nine guys trying to get home, you know, and they just have to defend themselves. And it's so stylish. I mean, what you have a gang called a baseball furies where these guys got on baseball outfits and they got this, I mean, this psychedelic makeup on their face and they, they're fighting with baseball bats like they're fighting with ancient swords. And I mean, this movie is light years ahead of itself. Walter had a vision and he put together a, a movie uh, that Larry Gordon produced that has stood the test of time. 27 years ago, I had no idea that I'd be sitting here with a, a wonderful Frenchman named Laurent talking about the uh, cultural value of the warriors. That's a total surprise. I didn't think I'd live this long. Out of all the films I've ever done, this has been my best experience working with a bunch of incredible young actors on the streets of New York, and we had a blast. And my mom, when she saw the movie, she said, you almost look tough in that movie. So I got close. <laughs> I've been employed in half the 32 movies I've been in because of The Warriors, really, including two other ones by Walter. Just because this was my first film, and because of the way everyone was with me, and because of where we shot it, and, and absolutely 
every ingredient that created this experience in my life, I think this will have to be my favorite movie. And it's timeless, so it, it's just, it's never gone away. And I wanted to dedicate my few moments of recall to a very sweet friend and fan, Steve Duneau, who would have been so excited to receive a package like this that, that he could look at and listen to, but he unfortunately passed away. And I also wanted to dedicate it to our dear sweet Marcelino Sanchez. I hope they're having a conversation about it right now. Well, I think when you look back, there are a lot of movies today that are highly influenced by Walter's movies. Walter has a unique vision of the story he's trying to tell, and that's what I enjoyed about working with him, because we were trying to create this unique world. In the business, all the young screenwriters, all the young directors, everybody was just uh, always uh, their, one of their favorite films. As far as I was concerned, we had made a cartoon that people would not take seriously. I was way off base. People come up to you and say, are you the guy that did the Warriors? And say, well, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and then they say how much they liked it. And uh, so over the years, I just got this enormous amount of uh, people writing me and uh, coming up to me in the streets and all that kind of thing. And uh, so I was aware that it had this other life. And also people kept showing it. They kept having special screenings and all that kind of thing. See, one of the things I think that the film has uh, this other life is uh, there's a humorous aspect to the movie. You know, from the very beginning, the fun the audience had and the way they laughed at the jokes. Uh, there's a lot of humor that is put in there along with the Jeopardy, and the humor always played, and I think it still plays. Um, and uh, I think that's that accounts for a lot of the popularity of the movie. Yeah, that's right, warriors. Just keep walking. Real tough mothers, ain't you?